Welcome to another exciting Bible study with Rev. Dr. James A. Duncan, pastor of Shiloh Baptist Church. Faith study in the Word is designed to keep you fired up about your walk with the Lord. Fired up about our faith study in the Word with Pastor Duncan, author, teacher, and long-term educator with a burning desire to see every believer live a full life of faith in the redeeming power of God. This can only happen when we develop a hunger and thirst for studying the Word, God's Word. Thanks for joining us in tonight's study. Jingle bells, jingle bells, jingle all the way. Up on the housetop, reindeer paws. It's beginning to look a lot like Christmas everywhere you go. Wow. Do you know Christmas songs have a special place in our heart? And it's almost Christmas, but did you also know people who have suffered loss? People who have suffered loss of people this year, lost loved ones. Christmas time can be one of the most depressing and discouraging times it is. Uh, a lot more contemplation of suicide ideation. All kinds of things happen at Christmas. That's why this series is so relevant. We've been talking about, and I got a lot of feedback from you, so let somebody know that the principles in God's Word can help you get through your times of discouragement and depression. Depression is not as strong as God. Now, I took you through some things last week. Please go back and look at those messages because I don't have time to recap. But in those messages, I explained to you the clinical side of depression and I made it very clear what my message is to you. In this order, I believe with anything going wrong in our life, here it is, drum roll, go to God first. Then we go to man. God gave man wisdom, science, make sure. And get your medication if that's what you need. But when you get these principles of God and reinforce them, they can help. So we're going to cause number two this week. Come on, I'm not going to do too much recapping because I want us to see what God is saying about how we can overcome. So now we're talking about after we battle those spirits, we want you to know that God can work in depression. Grab your Bible. You know, you guys are used to sitting down just looking at folks. Grab your Bible, get you something to write with. I'm going to give you some scriptures up here that you can look at later and get. Or you can go back and watch this over again. Uh, grab somebody you know it's in trouble. A friend, uh, some friends, a loved one, a relative. Set them down and say, listen to this. Look at this. How God can help us battle these spirits. And so we're getting ready to go into the lesson now. You've just tuned into uh, making sure that we are, are happy about our faith, fired up about our faith, so that we know that our faith works. Let's get started. So what are we talking about tonight? Cause number two for depression and discouragement. Please watch it. Frustration. I want you to know that after a while, things will begin to mount up and you will give in to the frustration and that will take you straight down. You're frustrated, which leads to hopelessness, which leads to, I don't know how I'm going to handle this. And all of a sudden, you're not steady. You're not there. But tonight, I'm going to show you how to get the peace and the calm of God as we learn not to give in to the frustration. Now, our study has been clear. We have been looking at uh, God first, who is our infallible sir, you know, infallible source. So don't throw your hands up. I don't care how bad you are. God still works. And we've been looking at in this study those who were depressed and discouraged in the Bible. Hey, and guess what we found out? Some of the greatest saints have wrestled with depression and discouragement. So don't. First of all, that's. So get, first of all, get rid of stigma because you're wrestling and, you know, the enemy's always in your mind. Get rid of that because all of us battle through these times of discouragement and depression. So I want you to know some of the greatest people. We're going to look at the cause of their depression. We're going to look at the cause to help us identify things we need to avoid. So watch this. We're going to look at some of the... Uh, Patriarchs, the biblical giants, those who overcame, those who are our roadmaps and see, man, they had problems they had to wrestle with also. And after we look at them, we're going to also find out that what was the cause, what happened that caused that. And then we're going to look at some experiencing conditions in our own lives that persist, persist, 
precipitate, precipitate, uh, frustration. I'm getting frustrated saying participate. Okay. So we found out the first one was fatigue, overwork. We looked at this last week. Go back. It's like a depletion of energy. This is a big one. That's why I started with that one. Of course, our person was Elisha, and we found out what God did for Elisha. He provided him. He protected him. He refocused him. He chastised him. He encouraged him and sent him back to work. As I said, go get that. We're looking tonight at our second cause of discouragement. Here it is. Facing seemingly endless difficulties or feeling frustrated over all the things happening to us. Seems like we can't find relief. Changes in our life. Things not getting better. Uh, it's, it's a constant frustration will lead you to that place. I, I went to a funeral today and I get frustrated when people just don't act right. Don't do what they know is, is they supposed to do. What am I saying? I'm, I'm getting to the funeral, left my house in plenty of time. I'm riding down the road and right at one of the major lights, one of the major stoplights, I, I'm sitting there and start going over my notes in my head. And man, I look up and I've been there for 10 minutes. And I'm, I'm about seven, eight cars from where the light is and there's a line building up behind me. The light is never that long. So I start thinking what's going on. I, I was shocked that nobody had blew their horn. So I'm sitting there, and when I came out of it, my study was like, I need to say something. What are they doing? And what really frustrated me was every now and then, one of the cars, because it was like two lanes of us, one lane would start moving, and, and they figured out the light wasn't working, and the people in front of me weren't moving. So it wasn't me. <laughs> I, I'm telling you, it was not me. Somebody blew their horn, and all of a sudden, my light started, my line started moving. And of course, uh, I, when I got back through, coming back through that area after the funeral, someone had fixed the light. But why? Did, I was so frustrated. Like, I left early so I wouldn't be rushing, and now I'm stuck at a light 15 minutes because somebody won't go. Frustration, if I had already been depressed about something, can, can send you over the top. What causes uh, these kind of frustrations? So, our text tonight. Go to Numbers. Numbers. And we're going to look at 21 verses 4 and 5. And then I'll, I'll speak to you about that chapter. That chapter, Numbers 21, is a pivotal chapter in the life and history of the children of Israel. It's a chapter where they went from wandering in the wilderness to being settled and ready to go into the promised land. But I need you to understand. I'm going to read this. Then they set out of, from Mount Hor by the way of the Red Sea to go around the land of Edom. And the people became impatient because of the journey. The people spoke against Moses. Why have you brought us up out of Egypt to die in the wilderness? For there is no food Children of Israel were frustrated again. This is a major, why this text is so important is because this was the second generation. This was mainly the generation that supposedly had faith. And here they are after all this time in the wilderness. This is actually 39 years and several months. They're about to walk into the promised land. They wandered for 40 years. And even at the end of the wandering, they had not learned anything. So stay with me. This is, this is letting us know that God is trying to teach us not to be frustrated when things don't go our way. So I want you to see this. So first thing I want to tell you is don't give in to the frustration. Now you say, Pastor, that's easy to say don't give in. How you don't give in is understand several things. I'm not going to give you no, you know, any kind of easy formula stuff, but is when I understand that this is just something that I am prone to battle, I am better off than if I'm just out there all by myself. You know what I'm saying? Because I realize part of my falling condition is 
I'm apt to get frustrated. Frustrated, you know, come on, you've been married any sort of time, you have children, you've been in a job. Every once in a while, we'll get frustrated about the constant stuff we go through. And here's the problem about frustration is that once we get frustrated, we say and do things out of the frustration that we know are godly, so we know frustration does not come from a godly place, right? Uh-oh, somebody right now. Yes, I've done it, you've done it, we had to repent or apologize, but the reality is the frustration is doing more damage because it's taking us further down in our discouragement. Watch this. What? Bless me with something. I'm living my life, moving toward it, all of a sudden, I get an obstacle. And it seems like God just let it happen. You know what I mean? It's like, God, you made this promise, and now i got to deal with this. I can't focus on the promise. I'm dealing with something. There's always an obstruction. What else? Constant trials. Believe it or not, we can get to the point where we think we have more trials than somebody else, but it's just not true. Don't get mad at me, but it's just not true. All of us had trials. In this world, you shall have tribulation. Everybody. Nobody's exempt. But be a good true. I've overcome the world. Not only that. Trials is a situation uh, that I'm dealing with that it seems like it constantly, constantly. Uh, God should have shown up by now. I should have been out by now. I should, have been, I should have been delivered by now. That's my assessment. All I'm saying is don't let it get frustrate you, frustrating to you because God has perfect timing. We don't see it like that, right? When, when we see something going against us, God, I want you to get me out right now. And all that does is add to our frustration. But you have to know that God is three steps ahead of us. God always has a plan. Somebody say that with me. God always has a plan. I just got to know if I'm not out yet, I really, really, really believe this, then it's not my time to get out, but God will get me out. I got to hang in there. Real study just on these. Reoccurring trials is I overcome something. You ever had this feeling? And I overcome it. And I know sure enough, I know the scripture. I, I got the word in me. I've even instructed other people how to overcome it. And here it comes back on me again. Failures, the it's me again syndrome. Now, some people are so prideful, they don't admit they have failures. But I get you get really frustrated when uh, you, have, you ever beat yourself up, been down on yourself because you know you knew better. You know you shouldn't have done that. You know that that was something you shouldn't have thought. You shouldn't have let yourself get that way. You don't believe me? Then think about, uh, and I'll just give you a common one. I'm not talking about anybody, but you got to watch, especially in this pandemic. You tell yourself, I'm going to eat uh, a little dish of ice cream. And you end up eating the whole pint or the quart. Then it gets good tea, so I might as well keep going. <laughs> and all of a sudden, when you're done, gut out to here, you're sitting down there saying, why did I do that again? All I'm saying is we allow, failures can really make us frustrated because in a way, it means I've lost control, and if I don't think properly, I'll think I can't regain control. But we can regain Take the next word, long suffering. Did you know suffering is cleansing? Did you know that suffering puts our focus back on God? Suffering actually takes some of the dumb stuff out of our life because we figure out I don't have time for that because suffering and long suffering meaning that if I can hang in there long I'm becoming an anointed champion of God you'll notice some of the most powerful people of God are those when they were in suffering they kept on worshiping they kept on trusting they kept now they didn't do that all of a sudden but they learned how to do it because they would not let the suffering. And plus, here's what usually happens. 
you find out, hey, I've been through that before. So all of a sudden, suffering just ends up making me stronger instead of worse. Now, I'm going to give you some verses. I want you to write these down. This is the most powerful text on how to make sure you get some patience. We heard patience is a virtue. You're right. It's a divine, godly virtue. All of us, come on, where are the folk that will admit like me? I am not a patient person by personality. Patience is not my character, but we're not the only ones. Patience is not any of our character, but let's find out what God said about patience so we can learn to get some. Come on. First thing in Romans. up and I become a better person knowing that tribulation work patience and patience gives me experience now I got experience so when the devil comes it's like uh uh no wrong person uh 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 can't do that here cause I've learned through this so you can't freak me out on this and I'm not jumping into anxiety over here and I won't let you put me in that mode today we learn come on where the folk know I'm talking about we learn that I've got experience in that area so I'm not as afraid as I would be. It's like driving when you first start driving and I remember how nervous I was to parallel park while somebody was sitting in the car. Now I whip the car in anywhere, scratch up the hubcaps and everything. All I'm saying is we're not as nervous on the highway because we have experience. So experience comes from going through the tribulations and here is what experience will do. I love this. Experience Thank you, God. So you let me go through tribulation, and I got hope. Not only that, James. Time to trial. Come, you kick it around. You are strong enough to handle what I'm, somebody know what I'm talking about. James 5 and 7. Be Rain. Watch what it said. I don't let it rain one time or get one dose of anointing or one fill from God. Say, okay, I'm good. No, I know that God, even though he has me waiting, there's some fruit getting ready to come up. He's going to give me a ladder rain or another dose of energy. So somebody right now, all you're doing is waiting on your ladder rain. The ladder rain is the anointing of God. The ladder rain is God saying you suffered enough. The ladder rain is God raising you up and you having a shouting party in your house. The ladder rain is looking the devil in the face and just laughing and rejoicing because you know you got the victory. The ladder rain is somebody right now looking at me who is standing strong underneath a pressure that you shouldn't even be able to handle. But you can because you learn how to be patient until God get, brings it through. So, which takes us to our verses. Frustration. And the people spoke against Moses. So, even though you may not see it, but when a new beginning comes, it also brings with it new trials. You know how someone uh, gets married and they're standing there 
and they're passing cake to one another and they're laughing and rejoicing and we're going on our honeymoon. Even though you're entering a good phase of your life, God said it's not good for man to be alone. You have your wife or your spouse or your husband. Here's what else you got to know. How many know a whole lot of trips come with that? Come on, a whole lot of ups and downs. Be honest. Come on, there's some times in the marriage when you got to have, you got to sit down and have that serious talk. You got to have that talk on why we stay, why we could. And the bottom line is, I don't have time to teach marriage right now. Only thing holding us together is God when we surrender ourselves to the Lord. Say, no, no. Uh, anybody would want to be married to you, uh, anybody wants to be married to me, nah, you fooling yourself. You are hard to live with, and so am I. Individuals living together have to take stuff from one another. Can I help somebody out? You scared to say it? I'm a, I'm a, I know you, know, you got a little stuff going on. I'll say it. You are hard to live with. God helps me live with you. Show this to somebody so they can see it. And they will know that I didn't say this. The preacher said it. But that's the reality of new beginnings. What's the new beginnings? The children of Israel, at the end of their 40 years, 39 years and some months, they're getting ready to go. They're like, they can see the promised land, the way the text is talking. That all they have to do, it could, be a, a, it could be as short as another seven, eight, ten miles. And they know this is the land God promised. Remember, they were cursed and had to go on a journey that took 40 years. It should have been 40 days because of their own unbelief. So I want you to see something about new beginnings. Let's learn. to the promised land, when they get to this place, a whole lot of other stuff starts happening and they don't realize. They become so frustrated until they lose it. Let's look at this. The conditions of their discouragement. What's the first lesson? If you're going to beat this discouragement from your past, uh, the last time you cried, and you were able to dry your tears, maybe you could stop crying faster this time. The last time you had an anxiety attack and you found the scripture that worked, maybe you put that scripture in your heart and, and you don't let the enemy destroy you because you know you already have that word. Maybe the last time you went into a place where you couldn't sleep, think about the song that you hung or or the verse that you have, or the thoughts, lock them in. See, what happens to us is the devil has no new tools. But if we don't learn from our past, we're going to repeat them again. Let's look at some of the things the children of Israel should have learned from the fact that we don't turn to other gods. Exodus 32, 26. This is some stuff in their past. We don't turn to other gods. Let's look at the verse. Then Moses stood in the gate of the camp and said, Who is on the Lord's side? Don't make me preach. Always stay on God's side. I don't care how bad it is, how much pressure. If you're in your house, keep your house godly. Keep your mind godly. Whenever the enemy tears down, put up another scripture. Whenever it tears down that thought, stay there until God does what he says he's going to do. What am I telling you? I'm telling you, Moses did again. Who's on the Lord's side? Let him come unto me. And all the sons of Levi gathered themselves unto him. Here is what the children of Israel knew. This was the second generation. So they were some young folk back when this incident happened, but they also saw several other incidents, so they should have been ready. You got a history of being saved. This is not your first, this is not the first time you went through what you're going through. And if it is, you still got some evidence from the past stuff you went through that God is able to bring you out. So what do I do? Here's what I figure out. Let me take this out of here. Here's what I figure out. I figure out in this story in Exodus, remember Moses went up to the camp. If you look at the 32nd uh, chapter of the book of Exodus, it starts like this. And when they saw, Moses had gone up to get the Ten Commandments. And when they saw Moses did not come back, they came to Aaron and said, We don't know what happened to this Moses. 
And Aaron said, take off your earrings, take off your jewelry, and they built a fire. I don't know where he got that from. It was part of their Egyptian training. Watch me. Sometimes when things get so tough, your mind starts drifting back to what you used to do. That's other gods. That's what they did. We got to get some of those gods we had in Egypt. So they built a golden calf. When they built a golden calf, they started doing what went with the golden calf. They started taking off their clothes and running around the camp and chasing each other and not caring about anything God said. They even had a nerve to say, these are the gods that brought us out of Egypt. That's when they caught the voice of God. God told Moses, go down there. When Moses went, he heard a noise coming. He was carrying the tablets, the Bible said. And he heard them. When he saw them frolicking all around, he threw those tablets down to the ground. And the crazy thing was, Moses looked at Aaron and said, what are you doing? Well, you know, the people always want to do wrong. This is Aaron's confession. And, and so uh, I built this, and, and, and Moses said, wait a minute. He took the golden calf, melted it down, burned it into powder, and, threw, and made the Israelites that had been unfaithful drink the powder that came from the ashes of the golden calf. Then he stood up and said, who's on the Lord's side? And do you know there were still some folk running around not on God's side? I got to stop there because here you are now knowing that the only safe side to be on is on the Lord's side. But when you get frustrated and depressed, you can start thinking of other things. Other, other, other gods come into play. Maybe I need a drink. Maybe, maybe I need to do something else. I need, you know, I need to fornicate. Um, maybe I need to... You know, take some more medicine here. Uh, I need to go party. I need, I need to stop going. I need to quit. You always think of another God, but none of them ever help you. You get frustrated when you start thinking about turning to other gods. So when he said, who's on the Lord's side? Matter of fact, 3,000 of them was killed that day. Remember from your past. So learn. What happened? Okay, so you're going through something, and, and you're really frustrated, and you feel like giving up. But what happened last time you left God? It was not pretty. And that's what's going on this time. Watch this. Numbers 14. Israel, how they got to this point in Numbers 21. Numbers 14. You remember the text? The curse of no faith when Moses sent out men to spy out the land and the ten brought back an evil report and only Joshua and Caleb brought back a good report and they were scared of the giants of the land. And you remember what happened. God got angry with them. And here's what God said because they didn't have enough faith to believe him. He said, well, yeah, there was giants there. God said, I'm stronger than your giants. I told you that's your land. Oh, wait a minute. God told you that's your healing. He told you he's going to get you out. Why would you stop now and fall under a curse that comes from no faith? Oh, I think about that sometimes when I'm, when I'm tempted not to have faith in a situation. It's, it's something, here's what God said. Your carcass shall fall in this wilderness. Twenty-nine. But up here I have verse 34 and 35. Write those down. Because they're important. That's when God actually did the curse. That's when he actually told them, you are going to die in this wilderness, every one of this generation. And now a journey that would have taken you 40 days, I'm going to send you. What, what, you do you know this was a turning point where God's, and this is so important, because you can be almost ready to get delivered, lose your faith, and God said, now go back to the wilderness. And now you wander around in the wilderness for another 40 years. Hard to imagine that I cut off my own blessing because I couldn't take it because I got frustrated because I was depressed and I was discouraged. And I let the frustration just break me. Not only that. Frightful study because it goes against an area that's in the heart of every man, and that is the ability not to come under any authority. We believe 
We believe that nobody has the right to tell us to do it. Every now and then, we'll buck. And the problem is, a lot of times when it is spiritual, you're not coming against a man or a woman. You're coming against God. You know the story? Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. Korah, Levi priest. Gathered together almost 150 other folk. Moses was giving them directions. Of course, things weren't going right. You need to pick up a manner of leadership before you start talking about how somebody leading. Leadership is not hard. Anybody who is led knows what I'm saying. Nothing goes smooth. So those of us of a certain generation know that obedience to authority is our salvation. But they all got together. And can you see them? Marching up to Moses and said, Moses. You're not the only one. You take too much on yourself. You're not the only one who has authority around here who can lead us. You're leading us wrong. And God, Moses said, no, get your pans, your sensor pans, put fire in them. And tomorrow we'll walk out and let the Lord tell us who it is that he is for. Now, what's cool about this is that in the interim, God showed up and said, Moses, get out the way. Israel when they when they came against God. I'm telling you what you can learn from them so you don't get frustrated. So they had to learn on the curse of disobedience. If you're sitting there frustrated to a word that you know, don't be disobedient to something you know God said. Continue to be obedient because you, you've already learned from your past mistake that being disobedient sends you to a place. So the next day, Moses got angry then because what he did, he went out and put out, you know, uh, Try to put out a, a, a leaf, you know, a white flag and said, can you please come? I want to talk to you, Cor. You're a Levite. Cor said, we're not coming nowhere. We don't care who you are. We're not coming, Moses. And Moses got angry and said, tomorrow, come up. And everybody got together in camp. And he told all the families, look, you got to move away from them. God spoke to him. God spoke to him. He said, look, move away from them. And then Moses told the people, watch this. God, move away from them. They have gone against what God said. But now you because God's going to answer a new thing. If God doesn't answer a new thing, then I'm not right. But God's going to answer a new thing. All of a sudden, if you can imagine, the earth opened up and swallowed all of them into the ground. They saw fire. They heard their screams. People started running saying, you know, we got to get out of here lest we be swallowed up. There was another place. This is all that state crazy stuff that happened to them in the wilderness. All I'm saying is, why are you frustrated? Learn from your past. Don't try another God. Don't walk around with no faith. Don't lose your faith. And don't, be, don't become disobedient to what you know God is calling you to do. Lesson number two. Learn from your past. Lesson number two is very important. Stay strong. I got to learn how to stay strong, although everything is powerful. Although stuff is piling up on me. Um, I notice I don't stand still anyway, but I got to learn how to stand still. I'm, I'm talking to someone, Psalms 46, be still and know that I'm God. I'm talking to someone, watch the salvation of the Lord. Sometimes, look, I'm, I declare to you, while you're standing still, God will never let you down. Just stand still. Watch this. They could see their goal. It was time and things started going bad. When they got to where they could see their goal, the verses we're talking about, they got frustrated because before they got to where they were about to get to the promised land, this. Miriam, the sister of Moses, the praise leader, when they came across the Red Sea, the one with the temple, the one who danced in front of the Lord, the one who encouraged them, Marion died. 20 and 1. They had no water. People got mad at
Marry and die. So we say, what's that? When a major person dies in our life, it affects us. Mother, father. I remember, you guys think about this. When Martin Luther King died, I was a little something. I still remember how it affected all of us. And when one of my mentors died, Diego and Hersey, I remember we all, that was, was at the cultural center, those of us he led, it affected us. We weren't seeing D every day. But when someone major in our life dies, it takes something out of us. I want you to see, before they got to this 21st chapter, in the 20th chapter, several things happened that led up to their frustrated condition. Marion died, then they had no water. Now, we could have stayed in Egypt and died. And I told you already, it's funny to me that this is the second generation, the new generation. You heard all the mother folk that died. And all of a sudden, this new generation is still frustrated. Moses strikes the rock. Well, Moses to Aaron and Moses, and God said, Moses, speak to the rock, and I'll give them water. Moses struck the rock, and the place was called Meribah. Place of strife. Oh, I gotta stop again. Somebody died. I start suffering needs. Now I'm in the middle of a battle of strife. Sound like your life? You know, the arguments, the struggle. Oh, we're in the middle of a pandemic. Maybe you got a need. The job happened. Uh, somebody got sick. Somebody walked out on you. Whatever it was, you ended up at a place of strife. Watch the frustration building. Watch it building. Then they get to the place where they're about to go in there. All they got to do is walk through Edom. They were at Kadesh. And all they had to do was go through Edom. And they could go. Well, the king of Edom said, you can't come through my land. Because now the children of Israel, holding in there, hanging there with Moses, Marion died, seeing Moses, Moses struck the rock. All of this stuff happened. They now were told, you got to go back. That's frustrating. In that 20th chapter right here, they were going to walk in the promised land, but the king of Edom said, you can't come through our property. Watch me, guys. So, God, why don't you move that out my way? There's a promise right there. Frustration. You move it out of everybody else's way. Nobody else going through this stuff I'm going through. I see other Christians happy. What's going on? Frustration. But, they got to go around. So now God sends them back around the back way into the promised land when they could have just went straight through. And they got to go through the mountain of horror. But watch this. In the 22nd verse, Aaron dies. Marion dies. Aaron dies. What happened was when Moses struck the rock, we always talk about the fact that God told Moses you could not enter the promised land. But if you look at the text, he told Moses and Aaron because you were rebellious. He already had a place Moses was going to die. So what he did was he said, Moses, you, Aaron, and Eleazar, his son, go up to the top of the mountain. There, take off Aaron's clothes, put him on his son because he's going to die on this mountain. The mountain Aaron died on was in the same place. Because, hey, this, is what, this is what I like about what God says. Aaron was of the generation that died, you know, because of their disobedience and all the other stuff. But Aaron also died because God said, you're not going to be exempt because you got a title. I said all those who forsook me were going to die. And Aaron could not get out of his place of making that golden calf. I'm just telling you, when you're looking back at your frustration... Oh, and wait a minute, the people here, they got no water, they can't go around, they got to go backwards. All of this led to <laughs> lesson three. Verses 1 through 3, if you look at it, it's one of the first times the Israelites in a long time got victory over their opponents. They were about to go into the promised land, and it says the Israelites were attacked. Matter of fact, let me, let me read this real quick. 
the Israelites were attacked and they were taken prisoner. King Arad lived in the southern area. When he heard that Israel was marching up toward him, um, he attacked them, captured some of them, and took them prisoner. They went to God, if you keep reading, and when they got to God, they decided that they were going to say, God, if you give us the victory, we'll destroy this land. We'll let nobody else use this land. It's the first time they came to God. What they wanted to show God is we, weren't, we don't want to win just for ourselves. Destroy this place. And so God gave them the victory. But right after God gave them the victory, verse 3, verse 4 and 5 happened. Verse 4 and 5. Come on, hang in there with me. I'm not done. They found themselves walking in circles. Because it said they went back to Mount Hor. Mount Hor means, uh, it actually means the mountain of wilderness. So they found themselves walking around in circles. They were, that's what frustration does to you. Now I'm walking around, God, where is our blessing at? What the God does for the frustrated? Here is what God does. They started arguing. They snapped. They told Moses, we're tired of this. They start talking about God. They start talking about everything. So God got so angry that he sent poisonous snakes down. And when he sent the poisonous snakes, they bit the people. And then Moses went and prayed as he interceded. And God said he put the bronze snake, built a large bronze snake. What was that all about? And he said, anybody who goes to the snake, who is bitten and goes to the snake, will be healed. I'm going to close this quickly because I can get into all the, you know, philosophical uh, theology about the snake, but that's not what's important. What's important is the principle. Why would God put a snake, let them get bitten by snakes first, and then put a snake for them to turn to for healing? Easy. What's the meaning of this snake? Easy. Follow me. Here is how God got the people from being frustrated. First thing God does is allow us to see we can't make it without him. God allowed something to happen that hurt them. He allowed it. He says, you think you can make it? You can just fuss? You can just go anywhere you want to go? You can just look and just get angry with me? After all I've been doing, God said, I love you so much. I'm not going to let you go that way. Thank you, God. And so he allowed the snakes to come. So the first thing God does is pull his hand back so we start reaching forward. That's good. I know. It's good, right? Watch this. Nobody ever explained a snake to you like that. There was no special magic in the snake. What happened was God wanted to see did they believe his word. He said, if you look, you do know that's what faith is. It's the seed of the miracle. It's the seed of the miracle. So he said, did, and they looked and were healed. Children of Israel, if we keep reading this text, you'll find out some more things happen to them. But this was monumental because really the ones who died here, Theologically, we believe that was the rest of that generation. So God kept his word. He killed off everybody who was unfaithful. And only those who were left faithful went to the promised land. It's Pastor Duncan. You're going to tune in next week. We got some good stuff. The third reason um, for how you can battle the cause, the third cause of it, and how you can battle depression and discouragement. See you next week. Have a great day. God bless you.